Welcome everyone to our final lecture in the series Sacred Trees. This is the Live Oak and Other Indigenous Trees of California presented by Julia Louise Bogany. This program is hosted by Bridge Projects. We are a contemporary gallery located physically in Hollywood, California and conceptually located at the cross section of contemporary art, art history, religious tradition and spirituality. We are funded by Howard and Roberta Amundsen. My name is Kara Megan Lewis and I am joined by my colleagues Linnea Sfranzi Noyf, Vicki Fung Smith and Michael Wright. Our current exhibition is in its final weeks. To Bow and to Bend features 31 artists whose works explore the spiritual, ecological, cultural and art historical significance of trees. And this Sacred Tree series has been accompanying this um, exhibition for the last uh, month. I am in front of a piece by Jill Delendro, who is a Portuguese artist who found a fallen oak in Debs Park and has made an acoustical instrument out of it. Um, there are contact mics that are hooked to whips that um, read the actual surface, the bark and the, the history of this tree. Um, the, which is the, an oak, which is native to California. So it is quite an honor to be able to introduce uh, Julia Louise Bogani, who is a Tongva elder. And I, re I learned recently that elder doesn't, doesn't just connote that you're older. Right. It means that you are wise in heart <laughs> and that you have dedicated um, your life to the preservation of the Tongva culture. And your granddaughter has followed in your steps, Erica. And so even though she is not as old as you, <laughs> she is also a Tongva elder. Um, you are still the cultural officer of the Gabrielino Tongva of San Gabriel, a cultural consultant. You have your own consulting business, Julia. Yes. And um, you're on countless committees and you give workshops um, from such varied topics such as water rights to pine needle basket weaving. And Julia is also passionate about the Tongva language and its preservation. Julia and her granddaughter Erica have started a website um, to increase the visibility of the Tongva culture and it is tobevisible.org. And I hope that our audience will visit that website after the lecture to learn more about the Tongva culture and those who are visiting or who are attending from outside of California, um, Tongva is the indigenous people of the Los Angeles Basin region who have been here since the turn of the Ice Age. So at that, I'm pleased to present Julia Bogany. Good afternoon, I'm Julia Bogany. I'm Gabrielina Tongva of San Gabriel. I'm um, I just had a birthday Thursday. I just turned 72. My grandma is, um, is who I did all my work for. And now I do it for my great granddaughter, Marissa, um, to, um, because my grandma died at, four, at 42 and my mother at 50. So I'm like, I'm 72, right? I need to do it to the younger generation. And uh, Marissa is uh, studying art right now. So that's really exciting. Uh, even though she wants to be a doctor. I just kind of thought she should do that for the summer. And um, um, I have four children, 12 grandchildren and 19 great grands. So I stay pretty busy along with, I work at, I'm the elder in residence at Claremont Colleges. And I work at several colleges with students on dissertations and um, just as a advisor. So I'm pleased to be here today. Do you want me to go to the next? Slide. Julia, do you want to start here? I'd, I'd like to start here. This is at the Cal mm -hmm. now called California uh, Gardens, which was uh, Santa, Ana, um, Santa Ana Botanical Gardens before. Uh, this oak is, is where I work every November, <laughs> doing acorn necklaces with children. And so um, I was doing another interview, and, and they said, where do you want to take a picture? I said, in front of this oak. I've never seen it. It's behind me all the time, right? But wow. I really enjoyed the, the portrait that they took of it and uh, what that oak means. So yeah, I don't know if you know the history of Santa Ana Botanical Gardens was started by uh, Susan Bixby. 
which was in my great grandma was her nanny. And when she, when she dedicated this garden to her, um, her father, when he died, she, she, she did all the native plants there because of my great grandmother who she learned from. So that's an interesting history from the botanical gardens. So this first oak here is the one in Pachanga. It's three, more than 3,000 years old. I just love that it's just like, it's kind of like hugging you, right? It's all around and, and all it's, um, it's just so strong. And that's why, I think that's, that's why a lot of us really identify with the oak because it is, a, it comes on that little tiny acorn comes this big oak that just surrounds us and, and lives forever, has lived way before we were here and will continue after we're gone. So here we have our men um, getting ready. They're getting ready to harvest the, the acorns. And so you notice they're not climbing the tree and throwing the branches around, but they're, they're just tapping the branches so that the acorns fall. And it's important. So because it's a family affair, I, I teach children that this is the way we get ready to prepare the meal of acorns. So now the women are gathering and the children are probably running around there somewhere. But uh, they're gathering the acorns into their baskets and the big baskets are the burden baskets that we'll see in the next slide. But they're gathering, they're picking them all up. They're not like choosing, but they're just picking them up from the ground because that's the easier way to do it than to just try to stand under that tree. So they, they, now they have them, they the strap around the head because this is a burden basket. and it, I always say it's a burden basket because probably they were really heavy with all those oaks in there. And then they have pan bags for uh, things that they were gathering as they were going that are not as heavy. And they're heading toward their village. So now they're here at the granary because they have put all the oaks and, and the acorns into that granary. And, and they got to protect the, so the oak tree only gives acorns every two years. And if you go to a grove, if we went to a village, you would see several oaks, but not all of them are giving every two, you know, in the same year. And so there's, there would be marked by the, by the, if you're in a Tongva village, by the Tongva, uh, they would have a marking for their family. And so anyone else from the Shumash or the Serrano could come and get oaks. Uh, if they needed them, they just never touched the ones that the trees were marked for the Tongva families. So it was, it was okay to come and just take whatever you needed, but we made sure to store for two years in these granaries and, to, and then we, um, they're made out of um, the branches to keep the acorns and they're pretty tightly woven so that the uh, squirrels don't come and decide they wanna harvest some. <laughs> so then we have a, our natural house, which is the key next to her. So it's always what, close to the house. Yes. And what um, what is the granary made of, and and also the kia? The key is made out of um, it's the key is made out of the house, the key, which is the key is made out of um, willow for the structure, and then it has tule reed on the outside, and then there's a hole at the top there, like a little chimney, right? And then there, when we didn't have uh, tule, we would use uh, cattail. The, the, oh, the granary itself is made out of another, out of the, the oak tree. So there's branches that make it so that it stays. It's kind of like you, if you refrigerate something within itself, it stays, but it all, it's also covered above to so kind of keep, um, the order of oaks getting out so that the, the um, animals wouldn't come and take, take it for their lunch. So here we're using a motar and a mano to, to crack open the uh, acorns. This is, um, and she's separating them. And this is, if you're just a, a small family, you're just doing it for your family, this is good enough, right? You don't need to have a big grinding stone, but we will show one next. But this is just a little, um, a small one for like a family is eating. But if let's say you're relative to the coming and or people are training, then you then you use the large uh, grinding stones so that 
several women could be doing it at the same time. So see, so this looks like she's sitting on the ground, but she's not. She's actually sitting on a big mortar and a huge stone that yes, it's like a, it has the hose embedded in there from grinding so much. And she's using a mono and it's larger because it has to go into the hole to, to crack open the, the acorns. Now we know that a lot of people, I, I hear them say that all the time. Well, we, we got some acorns and we just ate them like peanuts. And I said, you're poisoning yourself. The little red skin on, on the acorn, that's why we, we go through this process is poison, right? It's a it's a tanning, and it, we used it for for dyeing our our uh, deer skins and baskets to make them redder. So it's a tanning solution, and it's not something you can just take out of a tree like a peanut and eat it. So there's a brush there. It's made out of the wild onion to just kind of help get all the um, the meat out of the out of the bowl that's made out of stone. So now we're leaching it and it's not about just rinsing the acorns once, you have to do it at least five times till the water gets clear. So it's usually pretty red and then it starts turning yellow as you, because in between that they're taking off all the red little skin before in a whittling basket and then now they're leaching it, getting ready to prepare it for, for dinner. And we use the leaves inside the basket to keep keep it all safe so that it doesn't go through the basket. So now she's she's separating it, getting making sure there's no more uh, tanning in there, making sure it's you know there we always say make sure a good cook if you don't throw those acorns out of the basket while you're doing this. So, but she's just making sure that all the tanning is out. And it's ready for for cooking. So now this is this stone is called a substone. It's delight. It's delight. It maintains uh, uh, 400 degrees of heat, so you don't have to keep heating the stone up. Right, going into your food and taking it out back and forth is enough to cook the meal. So she's heating the the uh, substone, taking it out with the, with the, a stick carefully, and then she'll put it into the the bowl of uh, acorn mush and, and and cook it. But then there's a stick next to it that has a little ladder like a spoon that's made out of willow. Because willow maintains the heat very well. We use it to bend our willow. Um, and so she's putting gonna put that into the into the big bowl that she has there of it, which is a basket, right? With tar inside of it to make it so it doesn't leak. So, and so can you, uh, the role of the soapstone was actually the cooking mechanism, correct? That's yes. what heated the, okay. Right. So you, yeah, because it maintains the heat, right? You don't want to put that basket over the fire. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, so we had, so it, soapstone was a big trade for us. The soapstone came from Catalina. And it was our biggest trade. So this story is called uh, Tongba Gold because that was the biggest uh, trade we had across uh, California and beyond. So now she's steering it and you see the soapstone in there. She's not making sure it doesn't burn the basket. So I always say if you find a, a burned basket in at the museum, you know that there was, um, they forgot to move the stone. And so, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they boot, so they burn the basket. But we have one more step before some more steps before we finish. So she's just moving the stone, making sure it's getting thicker, right? So that it becomes just like a like a cream of wheat, I say, you know. So she's going to add to it now some elderberries, right? We like to have berries in our in our. Um, cream of wheat, oatmeal, whatever we may have in the morning. She's making just one just So the acorn is our flour. So we can make our, we can make our bread, our biscuits, our um, anything you use flour for. We use acorn cookies. Today we make cookies with them and, and, and all kinds of nuts. But we want, we always want that sweet part, right? So we would use berries to kind of help because it's, Acorn itself is not very sweet. 
So this is the same elderberry that we see in, um, in the uh, pharmacy that's been bottled and yeah. packaged, correct? Yeah. Right. And, and you it's can needed use, too. I used to carry them on my display tables and it, you know, they just dry up and, and they kind of would disappear because the kids like to eat them like they are, right? Like they're dried up. Like, yeah. and, and it's, it's, these elderberries is the first time we made, like, what is it called that kids like to use the, um, um, they're on a strip, like jello, but it's a strip, like, um, oh, fruit yeah, roll-ups, fruit, fruit, like, fruit roll like yes, fruit, fruit roll-ups, roll -ups. Yes. yeah, because you dry them out and you spread them out and you make, so we made the first fruit roll-ups out of elderberries. Oh my goodness, wow. I bet they were delicious and probably a lot healthier yes. than the fruit roll ups we have in the store. Yeah, because we had more sugar, right? We were just using the elderberries as they are. Right. Okay. And now it's time for dinner or breakfast. <laughs> They've been out there um, eating together as a family. And it's, it's kind of like I like these pictures to kind of show how the family works together and they eat together and uh, spend that time together, right? So here's the, I have an elderberry tree here because that's, that's the tree I work with a lot besides the willow and I didn't have a picture of a willow tree but I used the willow a lot. So there's the elderberry where it makes ja uh, jams and jelly out of the berries and, and medicine for also, for, and it dies, our, our good knocks can make a dye out of it, right, for our baskets. But we also make cough syrup and that's the cough syrup you see in the market. Now, we make cough syrup every year, and the kids love it because they can either eat it on their pancakes or take the cough syrup for the cold, for the cough. And it doesn't have the alcohol in it, so it'll last a, a whole year, right? Because we just make them like small bottles. Um, but they like doing that. And then the flowers, I, I just love the elderberry flowers. You just, you're just gonna use the flowers to make this great drink. You can put some chia in it, some lemonade, and the elderberry just makes a really great tasting tea. And then we have the bark of the tree, where the thicker part is. You can see where it's pointing to the thicker part. That mm -hmm. That's how we made our skirts that we wore out of the inner bark of the elderberry. We also make our instruments out of the elderberry. We have a clapper stick we make, because California Indians didn't have drums, so we make um, clapper sticks oh. and we make also these little like instead of medicine bags like a little a little uh, container to put our chia in or whatever we're traveling with or medicine bit you can call it a medicine bag and game pieces so that's what's on this little row is is we made our flutes our clapper sticks and then all kinds of game pieces mm. for toys and games so this is just showing the, how we how we use every part of the tree. And of course the animals come around also, right? They like elderberries. The bees like berries. And have you noticed that that's how they get the purple honey? It's from the elderberry. Mm -hmm. When bees are making honey. And so and also there's a lot of um yes, a lot of uses for every part of it. Julia, you're talking about, you know, the connectedness um, and kind of um, cohabitation between um, humans, the tree, and the animals. And I've read a little bit, you know, about the kinship relationship uh, between the indigenous people and the land, specifically in California. Can you talk a little bit about the practices of, of tending the land? Um, I, I heard that Tongva means people of the earth. And right. you've talked about how, um, you know, the Tongva don't believe that they owned the land, that they were gatekeepers of it. And right. so there was this, uh, the, the, the practice of tending. Can you talk a little bit about um, so, that? So, yes. So Tongva does mean people of the earth. And it also, um, we didn't have a name for, in our language, and none of the tribes actually do for the word nature because we are connected, we, it is a, like a connection to us. It's like, you know, we cannot survive without the, without the plants, without the animals, 
Uh, we don't just go um, in our time of, of taking deers for food. We did not just go take it and shoot it or with a bow and arrow or something. We, we went up to it and could say, thank you for giving your life for my family to be here. And then also the food that we plant, we don't just take the plants, right? We always give it uh, tobacco. And if you don't have the tobacco with you, then, and it's kind of like the, the tobacco works kind of like, a, um, like what we do today as using, um, what do you call it, when you put all the, st uh, the special food for the, for the plant, right? Because you're not Put just giving it a pinch. Yeah. So yeah. because it, it's giving something, because it, the, the tobacco that we're giving is pure, right? Yeah. And you're just giving it like a pinch. But if you don't have tobacco with you, then you have to pull your hair from your root and give it, a, you know, just a couple strands of hair, but it hurts to pull, <laughs> right? Because I, I was teaching the women and they were giving... They were giving me the hair from the brushes. And I said, no, that's not what we do. You have to pull it from your root. So you're actually sacrificing something for the sacrifice of the plant giving you something, right? Wow. And, and so that's, and so the reason we didn't have the word for nature, it was something that we just say the nature is because we are connected to everything. Mm -hmm. And so when we say, when I say life matters, I'm talking about all life. I'm talking about the water, the plants, the animals, the humans, we all matter. And in our circle, when we look at how we're made, humans are made last, right? Because we don't want to, we're not dominating. We're learning from the plants and from the animals and, and from everything. And we're just like the keepers. And so I always say the land was not stolen. It was the responsibility of taking care of the land like we should um, was taken. And, but now a lot of people are listening more to our stories and how we care for the land so that we can continue in this world without all the, uh, the heat we're having now, right? So, and, mm -hmm. and things that we need to take care of each other and take care of the plants and our animals and, you know, and human beings. Yeah, and I guess my question as uh, now someone who's fairly new, uh, <laughs> only four only four years in Los Angeles, and you know, in the in my backyard is are these groves of live oaks, and so what is our our role as as those who are new to California in this uh, act of preservation and of re, you know kind of resurfacing this um what i think they call traditional ecological knowledge um what role can we play what role can the attendees of this presentation play in that so i say a lot of times like sometimes you know if you're doing a class for a uh, school or a, at a nature center that it's um i have found that people are really cool about like if i'm in um, near the beach, people will bring me abalones, right? Uh, or they'll bring me acorns or, or nuts that people are great about trading mm -hmm. and, and saying, you know, we really thank you for coming today. And this is, and they bring you um, whatever they're, they have in the garden. It's about sharing. You know, it's not about, yes, uh, coming to an event, but it's about what do, what do we have that we have an abundance of that we can share? And that's how nobody ever winds, winds up with no food, right? You can, you can have, you can even attach a recipe to it if you know what, what you're preparing. Or if it's somebody that they know what to use, how to use it, then you're, you're still, it's, a, it's about giving. Because mm -hmm. I don't think we can ever over give. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think we need to hear more of that. Um, I do want to bring it back to the oak tree. Um, you had okay. mentioned, um, you had meant just before we opened it up to questions, you had mentioned to Vicki and I um, the story about the grandmother oak. And I'm curious about, specifically because of our space um, bridge project is at the intersection of uh, art, but also uh, spirituality, spirituality and religious tradition. And is there 
um, a cosmology or is there a sacred story um, connected to the oak tree? In Thousand Oaks, um, they have, in their nature center, they have this cute little book. All, all nature centers that usually have like old, a lot of oaks have the story mm -hmm. of the grandmother oak that, that explains to children her importance of who she is, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really neat to have. It's just a little simple, like $3 book, but it's a really great, a great story of, of, of explaining, like, like seeing the grandmother oak as somebody, right? Mm -hmm. So when we, so like I always said, we didn't have, we didn't have names till we went to puberty ceremony because mm -hmm. we had those t terms of endearment as saying sister, big sister, younger sister. And, and we had a saying for the plants. We called the, the oak tree a grandmother oak, right? And we might name, so if we have a child, we're not going to name her oak tree. We're going to name her acorn because she's to become big and strong. And, and so it's not about her because staying this little tiny acorn. It's that you want her to be, become a strong woman. So you name her acorn. Right. You're not going to start off when, you, when you're a grandma, then you become an oak. <laughs> Grandmother oak. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it speaks to this, this uh, kinship relationship. Right. Um, I, I have one final question just before we um, open it up to question, questions from the audience. Oh, actually, we have a good one that's related to um, our topic right now. Kyle asks, are, are trees always seen as female? No, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Have, you have to have both. <laughs> so you have like, to have like both. an avocado tree, right? I used, we just planted avocado trees at the springs. They have to mate, right? Yeah. In the, so, so do they both get fruit? You know, I never trusted, <laughs> but um, but you have to have both in order to have the fruit from the tree. So there what could be a grandfather oak as yeah, well. Yeah, there could be a grandfather. Yeah, <laughs> there's a grandfather in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but we all start as acorns, and that's yeah imp important to remember. Yes. I had a question um, about, this is actually related to an artwork in our exhibition. There's an artist who made a work from uh, wood, uh, trees that had burned in a recent fire two years ago. Um, it's uh, ponderosa pine and cedars and, um, and he's made a wreath, which is a memorial to the, the fire that devastated um, so much property. But um, in much of, the history of California, there was cultural burning. There was burning, controlled burning that um, was yes. tending the, was about tending the land. And so I would love to hear from your perspective, um, the, the role of cultural burning now. Um, um, we're talking to the forestry now to restart that education of how we do cultural burning. And also, you know, when we read um, the book of uh, trees talking to each other, Mm -hmm. um, they talk about how the older trees protect the babies as these fires are coming, you know, that the roots of the trees speak and, uh, and how they protect the young trees. But it's it, culture burning is something that's not here again, but we are talking about it with the forestry. Yeah, and what are, what are some of the pushback or what's some, what are some of the obstacles of, um, of that practice becoming more... Uh, I think it's because it was, um, you know, when you have a fire, you have new growth comes. But yeah. when we have fires in our parks today, usually there's a lot of junk around there, right? And a, in a contained fire, you don't have like people's lunch bags and bottles and everything else. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of a cleaner environment, right? Mm -hmm. Safety. Because you don't want to have all those fumes going into the, into what's happening. So it's about keeping the area healthy in order to do a healthy fire. That will just be for regrowth and not for, uh, just for killing the plants. 
Right, right. So it's going to take a lot of changing of, of yes. habits. Yeah, of our own human. Well, that's just um, like our dirt, right? I always say, when I was a kid, that was the last time you smelled dirt and you wanted to eat it. Today, you don't even smell it, right? And, yes. Right? You were watering the yard and you could smell the dirt and it just smelled so good. You just had to taste it. And we made uh, mud pies. I don't think children, none of my children are down into my great grands have ever smelled what a, 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 a dirt pie tastes like, <laughs> right? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's that smell after, because the rain brings it out. The yes. rain brings the... Uh, the geosimmons out into right. the air, and yeah, yeah it takes we're four connect. years. We've... Four years for you to recover that. <laughs> wow, four years of to to clean the soil, to clean the dirt. Yes, to clean the That's soil. Awesome. So when we start planting, you mm -hmm. know, when we're planting our plants now, it takes four years before you get the best food out of it, mm -hmm. because the the earth has to be reclaimed. Mm -hmm. And that's a learning process, right? Yeah. I'm going to start to ask some of the questions from our audience. Okay. Um, from Hope, she asks, what are the Tongva words for oak and corn? I don't have, I've, I've been taking my, I, have, I do have a Tongva dictionary, but we're in conference uh, right now. And since I haven't left my room, <laughs> I don't have it yeah. here. But uh, if she wants to send me in my um, website, I can send it to her. Okay, great. She can send me a note in my website. Yeah. Perfect. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to go back. I have to go back a little bit in this chat. Okay. What, what plants grow near oaks? Um, typically, this is from Mahida. Um, and are there stories about the plants that grow near orcs, oaks? Maybe that they, maybe the, the plants that uh, maybe share the connected, uh, the, what is it, microsoidal network, the fungi. Um, are there trees or plants that benefit oak trees? I haven't heard, but you know, I, I yeah. used to say, I didn't, I didn't do planting because I kill plastic, but now it seems like the plants keep calling me. So I'm now I'm studying the plants. <laughs> I do yeah. things that I make out of plants, but not right. things that, that I plant. And one of the things that you make out of plants um, are the pine needle baskets, That's correct? It. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I always, I like making pine needle baskets. That's a modern thing because uh, mm -hmm. pine needles okay. isn't one of our authentic baskets, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a new thing. And so we make a lot of pine needle uh, jewelry and baskets because it's, uh, if, if you're teaching at a class, it's easy for kids to gather them before they go to class and to make ha hair brushes and um, baskets. It doesn't take long, and it's it's so, so thrilling to children to see what mm -hmm. it's like. I do do pine needle classes, right? But it's but the, it doesn't take the, a lot of work. Because <laughs> yes, the bundles are the the pine needles are bundled together. Yeah, so it's always better to get like the longer needles, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then speaking of um, baskets and containers, um, Kyle asks, how do you overcome the potential problem of moisture in the acorn granaries? Specifically, if you're, you know, they're holding them for two years, how does, um, how does moisture stay out of those? I, well, I think they're actually holding them for one year and no, there's no moisture because okay. there's, uh, you know, it's the granary is, separate from the right close to the house but there's no moisture getting in there because it's totally covered with the, not only the the bark of the wood there's a, another plant that curls around it it's a smell and I can't think of the name of it we make baskets out of it with the leaves on it and it's to keep the the animals from trying to get in there so it wouldn't be like a fire hydrant for a dog right <laughs> right <laughs> I imagine you're not going to get moisture Right, 
So, they're so it has a smell that repels. Right. Dog. It's a wow. repellent of another plant that yet yeah, is twined around it. Yeah. Wow. Um, so Vicki was able to look up on your site. Um, quar is the word for acorn. And I don't know if I want to try to pronounce this, but we ashar for oak tree. Perhaps. I don't know. Spell it to me. Okay, I'll spell it to you. Yes, it's better. W -E with a apostrophe, A-A-S-H-A-R. Yesha. Yesha. <laughs> so I just finished a, um, they're not in there yet. There's the coloring book of animals with their names in Tongva, but I just finished mm -hmm. a, a plant and insect that's a book, coloring book that's going to be printed. And mm -hmm. uh, the horses of water, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of a series I'm doing for kids to learn the language. That's so great. We'll be able to look out for that on your website. Yes. Okay. So another question from Mahida. She asks, is it, or is it true that acorn meal satisfies hunger for many, many hours? No, that's chia. <laughs> ah, yeah. So, so it, it's a good meal. It's, it's you know, it's kind of like our, our, it's our bread, right? So, yeah. but if you're, if let's say the hunters were out there hunting and I always say they couldn't stop at 7-Eleven or they didn't pack peanut butter sandwiches with them. <laughs> they just put a little bit of chia on the tip of their tongue and it would take them for hours till they finished hunting. Wow. You know. Yeah, and now we sprinkle it and I sprinkle it on our cereal. Again, it's this, you it's know, these things sprinkles that are turning good. up in our <laughs> <laughs> But a lot of people spoon it and it's and it becomes yeah. a problem. Yes. So um, from Hope, she asks or says, My garden has five coastal oaks, and an okay. arborist has told her that the oak trees are companions to one another. And that if one is cut, the others will suffer. Yes. Is that true? <laughs> I read that, yeah. <laughs> it's because they, they have feelings for each other, right? If you, t if you read, there's a lot of stuff out there on, on that relationship of trees, right? Yes. And they, and, they, and they have feelings like we do. So I always tell when I taught preschool, I always tell kids, don't kick the tree, you're hurting its feelings. And I said, and they'd look at me and I said, but it's a tree. Yeah, but it still has feelings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm getting everybody here. Let's see. Um, there's acorn starch at Korean stores. Did you know that they sell acorn yes. starch? Yes. Well, they and uh, they also sell sell the. Um, acorn um, meal so mm -hmm. yeah at korean stores and you can my my cousin always makes cookies for the event we have at the acorn festival or she'll make uh, like bread and mm -hmm. to share but she buys hers there <laughs> but we don't do so all you that. don't have to <laughs> yes you don't have to grind it one by one yeah and i have a friend that makes coffee out of acorns and it is real it takes like a cappuccino <laughs> Yeah. Wow. yeah, it's really good. Because when she first told me, I said, really? <laughs> but it does taste like cappuccino. Interesting. I would not have thought that. Yeah. Um, oh, let's see. So, um, and then she followed up with a coffee out of what? And it's the, uh, it's the acorn that, yeah. yeah, acorn that tastes like cappuccino. Yeah. yeah. So my colleagues have a couple of questions. And okay. so I'm thinking that why don't you make yourself unmuted, team? And Vicky, do you want to ask your question? And then Michael? Oh, sure. Um, it's, it's amazing all the um, knowledge you have, Julia, like talking about, oh, yeah, it's the <laughs> shell of the skin of acorns. It's poisonous. Um, it takes four years for the soil to clean itself and naturally filter. 
um, where did you get all this, your information or your wisdom? Is it from your family, your, your grandmother? We pass it down from family, <laughs> you know. Yeah. We yeah. have some good plant experts out there. And then now that I'm studying more, I'm reading more also, you know. Mm -hmm. Julia, I was uh, really impressed by how elegant the tools in the built environment of the Tongva people are and how close they are to the, uh, the biological world. And I, now we live in a world dominated by plastic and metals and everything's disposable. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> I, I don't think we, we asked people when they came here what, what they were doing, right? Because I do a whole class on abalones and I show them how if, you know, we cover the hose to make a bow, right, out of tar, we, talk, we cover just the hose to make our bow. And then if it breaks, then you have a spoon because it has that deep part in it, like a soup spoon. And then, you, you know, you shave it off a little, but then you use the rest of it to make jewelry, you know, that's really popular. <laughs> So we really didn't give any, just throw things away. We just kind of learn how to use it. So. I feel like we need to recover I, that and sit at your feet, learn that again. Yes. I uh, had a question about the soapstone. Uh -huh. so you say that it came from Catalina? Yes. And so I assume there was a regular sort of Canoes, There's uh, mines there. Mines. Yeah. Oh, and so people would go over. I assume that they would go over on canoe because you'd have to right. bring them all back. And so, how many people would go over? Like, how much of an in, of a of a practice was this? So, Catalina actually was one of our islands. So there was, there's a story of an Almani about the little boy who breaks the, because when we started making pots, and I have some in my uh, nature center, they're made out of soapstone. They're big pots for boiling water, right? You don't have to have no fire in them, you just heat it up and it'll keep your food, go, you know, hot. But it also, he takes a four days journey from, um, what is that called from um, right there in Highland Park all the way to Catalina to bring a bow back because he was so busy with this little um, rabbit stick that he broke the bow and he had to go get another one because the thing is that when you took something or destroyed something you had to make it better for whoever because it's never your thing that you break right <laughs> mm -hmm. so you had to make it better and that's how the that's how the tribe stayed balanced right so like if I came and took your basket because I really liked it and then I took it home and maybe my kids broke it and then somebody would say well I heard you took her basket so you got to make her one better you can't just say well it's broken now right you have to make something better for that person um, another question from <laughs> I we have they keep coming in um <laughs> Someone wanted to ask you, um, she, they say greetings to Elder Julia Boveni. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you mean when you said that Tongva people don't have a word for nature because of the interconnectedness? Does this mean that you consider human beings as nature together with animal, plant, and rock? Um, that we are not We're separate, all connected. That we're all we're connected. relatives. Mm -hmm. We say no word for nature because we're related. Right, we cannot live without those things, so we have to be related, and that's how you show respect. To we have no respect for water, plants, animals, because we don't see that it takes that to help us live as human beings. So, if you're connected, you don't make it a word of nature because then you separate us. Yeah, it's about this um, almost a cosmology of, of kinship. But I don't think any of us are going to look at the oak the same way or walk down the pharmacy aisle and see elderberry in the same way. Now we, we have been 
gifted with such a, a knowledge um, that comes from your ancestors. Um, and so we will do our best to also share that story, and preserve the, the, the story of the Tongva people in our area. Thank you. Um, and I, we are going to conclude our program here. And then we're going to allow anybody to um, stick around for our after party. And <laughs> between, that, between that time, Julia, I'm actually gonna share a video um, that we made about our exhibition because I have a feeling that a lot of attendees are joining us at Bridge Projects for the first time. So I'm gonna take okay. an opportunity to, sh to share a video about our show. And then um, if you'll day on for our, our little casual after party so we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much everyone for being here. Those of you who want to see the video, please stay on. And those of you who want to chat in person with Julia Bogany, please, um, please stick around. Thank you.